afternoon, everyone. Sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, I'm Shuja Nawaz. Uh, I'm, the, I'm a distinguished fellow at the South Asia Center of the Atlantic Council, and I'm delighted that you all have come here despite the rain. Um, I'm also delighted to, to welcome back to Washington Mr. Shahriyar Kabir. Uh, he has done some most interesting research uh, and publications as well as documentaries uh, on uh, religious extremism and militancy in South Asia, and particularly the experience in Bangladesh. Uh, and today, <coughs> I'm hoping that we will benefit from some of his more recent work. Um, and I would suggested that it would be useful to draw some lessons from his knowledge and his experience, which would apply not just to Bangladesh, but also to other countries in the region that are facing the same challenges. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read his entire very impressive no, no, uh, biography, but uh, just to say that uh, you know he is uh, a Renaissance man, uh, a man of many parts, a journalist, a filmmaker, and uh, as I think he would put it himself, most importantly, uh, somebody who is a human rights activist, somebody who is uh, helping educate people about human rights. Um, so um, he has uh, also made some very interesting documentaries, including one called uh, Cry for Justice, There's the first uh, one. which is made on the Bangladesh Liberation War. That was uh, uh, what started him off on this, this career, I, I would think. Um, and now he is working on a couple of papers looking at communal persecutions and the rise of fundamentalist militant groups in Bangladesh. Uh, and I hope that we will learn a bit more about some of that work in progress. So um, the way, uh, as you know, our uh, sessions are organized, I'm going to ask him to speak briefly, uh, 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll open it up to a conversation. And we hope that your questions will prompt the answers and we'll get the conversation moving forward. So Mr. Kabir. Uh, thank you, Shri Janavas, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Right now, as you know, the situation in Bangladesh, though we have a secular democratic government, and uh, still we are watching uh, a kind of Islamic extremism, as well as persecution of the religious uh, and ethnic minorities. But this is not very new in Bangladesh. As you know that it was created, Bangladesh was liberated on the basis of secular democracy. We fought a liberation war in 1971. And after that, uh, Bangladesh adopted a magnificent constitution that included four basic principles of the state as uh, democracy, secularism, socialism, and nationalism. And more interestingly, there was one clause to protect secularism as a guarantee clause of secularism political or any kind of organization on the basis of religion was prohibited in 1972's constitution. That was a very interesting part of our constitution. Because during the liberation war of Bangladesh, you know, three million people were being killed uh, by Pakistani occupation army, as well as their local collaborators, Jamaat Islami and other Islamist parties. And was perpetrated against Islam. So this Jamaat Islami, well, this party, you know about Jamaat Islami, it was formed in South Asia uh, in 1941. The founding uh, founder of Jamaat Islami is Abu Lala Maududi. He borrowed his idea from Muslim Brotherhood before Jamaat Islami. Muslim Brotherhood was set up in Egypt, headed by Hassan al-Banna, and later the ideologue was Said Qutub. So Maududi borrowed certain ideas from Muslim Brotherhood and writings of Hassan al-Banna. I have mentioned all these things in my previous documentaries. You can watch it in the YouTube. These are available. There are three documentaries yeah, I recommend you to watch to understand rise of Islamic militancy in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, and South Asia, as well as 
Jamaat e Islami's link with other Islamist extremist organizations across the world, like uh, Al Qaeda, like Muslim Brotherhood, or AKP in Turkey. So, this idea, you know, that is what Maududi preached that is political Islam dubbed with terrorism. If you read uh, writings of Maududi, Abu Lala Maududi, he justified any kind of killing or any kind of terrorist activities uh, in the name of Islam. And uh, what uh, Wahhab uh, priest, you know, been Wahhab priest in uh, 100, 200 years back in Saudi Arabia, and that also derived from some extreme interpreter, Islamic, you know, imams, Ibn Taymiyyah of 13th century or Imam Ibn Hanbal, who justified jihad. And Maududi, interestingly, there are five basic principles uh, the general Muslims, they practice, you know, they follow the, in Islam, there are principles, uh, Shuja Bhai, you know better. That is how we say that namaz, roza, hajj, zakat, and iman. Imam means faith. But what Maududi did, he replaced Iman with Jihad. He said that, no, Iman is not very important. Jihad is the most important thing. And the, he, the way he interpreted Jihad, that is not the original interpretation of Jihad that mentioned in Quran. But well, Maududi and his followers or his followers, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, they have their own interpretation of Islam. So that justifies, as I said, that justify any type of killing, any type of uh, crimes against humanity in the name of Islam. So that the worst expression we have seen in Bangladesh Liberation War, three million people have been killed and officially 200,000 women were raped brutally and that is in the name of Islam. That's why it was easy for the framers of our constitution who framed the constitution of 1972 to prohibit uh, formation of political parties or any other organization on the basis of religion. And I remember that a very famous speech by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the founding father of Bangladesh. He said that, well, we do believe in secularism, but Bangladeshi interpretation of secularism is quite different from the European, particularly French interpretation of secularism. In France, you know, they call it laicite. Laicite is, uh, well, I'd rather say that it is very rigid, and if a secularist in, uh, under Laishit, he cannot practice religion and he cannot go to church. But in Bangladesh, Mujib, who had, Mujib said that, well, our secularism is not negation of religion. People will practice their faith, but what we want, we want to separate religion from a state and politics, not only from a state. In USA, it is separated from a state, only a state affairs, but he separated even from politics. That's why he prohibited formation of political parties. But unfortunately, after his brutal assassination in 1975, the history took a reverse position. We are watching a kind of Islamization of our society and politics. That is started since the assassination of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman in 1975. The new government, General Zia's government, they removed secularism, nationalism, socialism from the constitution and the bar on the formation of religion that was also removed. And thus, we have seen in 1976, uh, nearly 66 political parties emerged in the name of Islam, including Jamaat Islami. So since then, the society, most of the time, you know, Bangladesh was ruled by pro-Islamist. It is very unfortunate. And uh, the society started getting radicalized, you know, and since the mid 70s, we have also started exporting human uh, resources to Middle Eastern countries, particularly Saudi Arabia. The cheap labor, you know, Bangladesh used to export laborers in Saudi Arabia and Middle Eastern countries. And when they come back to Bangladesh, they not only bring the petrodollars, they also bring the Wahhabi culture with them. That is also quite sick, uh, be, be, be interesting that how the society is getting radicalized. So there are many multinational Multi, well, multi-dimensional, you know, uh, features, the way our society has been radicalized. One is that petrodollars coming from Middle Eastern countries that is backing Jamaat Islami. And since Jamaat Islami was reintroduced and uh, reorganized in Bangladesh, 
they started bringing money from the Middle Eastern countries in the name of you know, promoting Islam, setting up madrasas and mosques, new mosques. And there are billions of dollars came from Middle Eastern countries. And one of the largest Islamic NGO that is Rabital Islamia, when they have a huge network in Bangladesh, Rabita is considered to be the largest NGO in the world and funded by Saudi, you know, sheikhs, the royal family. So they have already started, they built up a huge economic empire. And then we can see their influences over the madrasas, you know. Madrasa, you know, we have three education system in Madra Bangladesh. One is madrasa system, one is general education, and one is English medium that is American and British, follow the British curriculums. But madrasas are, with, there is a sizable number of madrasas, both private and public, but even the public madrasas, still they now follow those uh, extremist curriculum, the writings of Maududi and other, uh, you know, hobby uh, ideas. And recently, two years back, uh, we have examined the madrasa curriculums, uh, particularly the public madrasas. Those are funded by government, by the taxpayers. And we have seen that uh, they are teaching that uh, democracy is an infidel idea, secularism is an infidel idea, and those who follow these things, you know, preach these ideas, they are enemy of Islam. So these are the things taught in madrasas. So this is the way, this is the reason when this Afghan jihad started uh, in 80s, we have seen Jamaat Islami recruited number of jihadists from Bangladesh to fight, uh, you know, Initially, the you know, Soviet-backed Najibullah's government in the name of Jihad. At that time, nearly 5,000 Bangladeshis uh, joined Jihad. And I mentioned, I elaborately in my film, Portrait of Jihad. You can watch it in the YouTube. So they came. The, they came from Pakistan. They came from other countries to recruit Jihadis. And they fought Jihad. And after that, at one point, you know it very well that how America has abandoned Taliban's after the war, Afghan Jihad, and they came back, most of them, they came back to Bangladesh, and they started uh, recruiting more jihadis to fight jihad in Burma or in Kashmir, in Palestine, or in other Bosnia, Chechnya, in other countries, and they started exporting jihad. And it's interestingly, when Jamaat Islami assumed power with the help of BNP in 2001, we have seen a mushroom growth of Islamic militant organizations in Bangladesh. That is, at that time, we have calculated 125 organizations like Harkatul Jihad, Jamaatul Mujahideen, and many, many others. You know, you can find our website in the internet. So, at that time, this radicalization, as well as the persecution of the religious minorities, that was, that was also on height, you know, we, people like us who protested these things, we are put into jail and we are tortured. And many, many things happened, violation, gross violation of human rights took place. And government at that time, definitely, since the government was Jamaat Islam and BNP, they denied everything. The denial was one of the major factors. And uh, that was, that's why we call it, it is a state-sponsored, you know, persecution on religious minorities and the violation of human rights. That is also government was responsible basically for that because they denied. But now what we are watching since this present government, the Amiri government, though they are secular, they are, you know, constitution, but it's still we can see that uh, this persecution is still going on, not in that scale, what we have seen from 2001 to 2006, but it's still Hindus and Christians and uh, Buddhists, they have been persecuted, free thinkers have been killed, the Hindu priest and uh, Christian priest, as well as a Buddhist monk, they have been killed over the by a couple of years, and I, you can watch it. I have presented one my recent film on that, Huidar Bangladesh. It is with Alternative Council. If you want to watch it, they can show you. So this is one thing committed by the non-state actors, that is Jamaat Islami, though their agenda is very much clear, they want to convert Bangladesh into a monolithic Muslim country like Mullah Umar's Afghanistan or Zia ul Haq's Pakistan. That is their agenda. They're, that they want that there should be no non-Muslims or even the Muslims who do not share their views of their interpretation of Islam, like people like us, 
And even the Ahmadis, you know, there is one Muslim community named Ahmadi Muslims, you know. In Pakistan, Ahmadi Muslims are declared as non-Muslims, but in Bangladesh, definitely they are Muslims, you know, and Jamaat Islami pushing a strong pressure on the government to declare Ahmadis as non-Muslims. And as well as they are also putting a strong pressure on our government to enact blasphemy law like Pakistan. So, well, that is also a very interesting thing, you know. When Jamaat Islami was in power, they never showed any interest to enact blasphemy law, but whenever Awami League, the secular parties are in power, they put a pressure on the government to enact blasphemy law. So that is the double standard of Jamaat Islami, you know, because they know that this blas enacting blasphemy law will not be appreciated by the Western countries, USA or European community will not encourage it. So that's why when they are in power, they, know, they don't say anything about, you know, banning Ahmadis and non-Muslims or introducing, enacting blasphemy law. But when Awami League is in power, they campaign for enacting blasphemy law or declaring Ahmadis and non-Muslims. So this is the double standard with Jamaat Islamist politics. But right now, what we are watching in Bangladesh, well, persecuting is still going there. It is basically, it is the non-state actors are responsible, but to some extent, government has failed to punish or to bring those perpetrators to book. So that is also a great problem. And the problem, you know, well, uh, uh, certainly there are certain problems in our judicial system, in our law as well, because we are following the old, very old British law, you know, 150 years old, you know, Evidence Act, see under CRPC that if a uh, woman has been raped, you need to produce at least two eyewitnesses or there are medical uh, certificate is needed, visceral report is needed. But think about those uh, turmoil, turmoil period, uh, turbulent period when during the communal violence when they take place, it is a mass hysteria has been created when a woman is being raped. It is not possible for her to present an eyewitness before that court. And if there is no eyewitness, the so court is not going to accept it. So now we are asking, you know, government to enact new laws to set up minority commission like Pakistan and India to look into the areas of discrimination in the minorities. But most important thing, what we are campaigning for the last 24 years, that we have to go back to our original constitution, that is a secular democratic constitution that prohibited formation of any kind of organization on the basis of religion. Religion, we believe that it is a very personal matter, Religions have nothing to do with politics, and we are telling our government as well as the Jamaat Islami, don't bring Allah in politics. Let Allah remain in His own place, you know. But uh, over the years, as I said, that it is not only Bangladesh. If you look into uh, look from the Muslim majority countries, from Turkey to Indonesia, you will see that the ground for secular democracy, ground for secular humanism, is shrinking and rise of Islamic militancy or the extremism, Islamist parties or the Islamic forces are growing largely in these countries. Turkey, think about Turkey. Turkey was the first country that declared secularism, that adopted secularism as one of the basic principles, and they prohibited all kinds of religious activities in Turkey, including they closed down all the Sufi centers as well. But as a result, what you have seen, the backlash, and now for the last 14 years, Turkey has been ruled by a strong Islamist uh, AKP. So this is the situation in Turkey. And uh, from Turkey to Indonesia, most of the country is now ruled by the Islamist or pro-Islamist. There are very few Muslim majority countries among the YC. You know, there are 57 members in YC, Organization of the Islamic Countries. Very few, they have a secular government. But secularism promoting or practicing in Bangladesh or in Pakistan, now, it's becoming very, very difficult gradually, though we are campaigning to promote secularism not only in Bangladesh, but in other parts of the world. In 2012, we have set up Forum for Secular Pakistan, and our friends in Pakistan who are fighting for secular democracy, for secular humanism, though they are small in number, but it is growing. I can tell you that their support is also growing. But it's still, as long as this Jamaat Islami or this extremist they will get their support from ISI of Pakistan or Saudi Arabia, and to some, to some extent even from USA, the moral support. They are getting moral support from USA. 
Whenever, you know, we ask our government to ban Jamaat Islami, the, our friends in the State Department or others, you know, policymakers, they say that no, we do. We consider Jamaat Islami as a moderate Islamic party. Don't ban Jamaat Islami. If you ban Jamaat Islami, it will go underground and it will become more terrorist. It will be difficult for us to monitor them and you allow them to work and participate in the democratic, you know, process. So that is the view of Jamaat Islami. But in Bangladesh, we have hundreds and thousands of evidence how Jamaat Islami is linked with terrorism in Bangladesh and how they are exporting terrorism in other parts of the world, how they are linked with Al Qaeda and IS, how they are linked with Muslim Brotherhood or AKP, or Kemal Islam in Indonesia and Malaysia. So these jihadists, they have already set up a global network, a terrorist network, not only in the Muslim majority countries, in the Western countries, you have seen how Western societies are getting radicalized, particularly the Muslim diaspora in the West. How can you explain that uh, till now more than 5,000 Europeans went to fight jihad in Syria? It is not only the, you know, Bangladeshi origin or Pakistani or Middle Eastern origin. There are many white Europeans. They went to fight jihad in Syria, both boys and girls. So this radicalization of the Muslim diaspora in the West is also becoming a very big threat for the secular humanist values, not only for the West, for the global mankind. So that is also very important that we need to, you know, adopt. There is a need to adopt, you know, de-radicalization strategy. The problem is that when we talk about terrorism, terrorism in the name of Islam or religion, the Western government in the USA or in the Europe, I have seen that the government considers that it's a matter, it's a law and order situation. It is something like mafia-type terrorism and homeland security and other government agencies are quite good enough to tackle this problem. But our, my view is that this terrorism, definitely it has certain ideas, ideals and uh, philosophy, politics, that derived from Wahhabism, that derived from Maududism, you have to fight it philosophically, politically, ideologically, theoretically. Military action for a short time, it can help you. You can suppress by military or by force, but if you want to eliminate these elements, definitely you have to fight it philosophically. Think about Cold War period. What US and the Western world presented before that, fighting the communism. Well, they have the narratives of democracy, they have narratives of freedom of expression, and that is the, that is the reason they succeeded to overthrow those uh, uh, you know, totalitarian government in uh, Eastern East European countries as well as Soviet Union. But nowadays, these narratives, counter narratives of uh, you know, uh, Wahhabism or Maududism, it is not that visible. We are writing in our own way, but our writings are so small, so tiny, it's a peanut in compared with Jamaati narratives. They are publishing volumes, hundreds and thousands of you know, publications are there. In my film, you know, The Ultimate Jihad, I have examined the British you know, uh, libraries, and some of the British experts said that most of the British public libraries are swept away with Maududis literature. And Saudi Arabia is distributing those literature free of cost to the public libraries. And even in my film, Lord Avery said that even in Westminster Library, there are volumes of Maududis writing because they gifted it as a gift from Saudi Arabia. So they kept it in the library. But these libraries, the books are responsible for radicalizing the society, the Western society. That is the reason why now 5,000 youth have joined jihad from Western countries. So this is also very important, what we are trying to promote. This is not a problem of Bangladesh. This is not a problem of Pakistan alone. And no government can fight this terrorism alone without the support of the civil society in Bangladesh. We are supporting our government uh, in fighting you know, terrorism. And uh, we have our own narratives, but in terms of you know Saudi Arabia or in terms of the Wahhabi narratives and the, their propaganda materials, our you know effort is very negligible. So that's why we are looking forward uh, to the Western countries. That well, if you want to eliminate terrorism and if you do business, definitely do not consider Jamaat-e-Islami as a moderate Islamic party. 
And if you want to help uh, eliminate terrorism, definitely you have to help those secular democratic institutions, organizations, both political parties and civil society initiatives who are fighting terrorism in the grassroots in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and elsewhere. So for now, I'd like to stop here, and I'd appreciate your comments or any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kabir. Uh, and as you know, we have a very rich, uh, highly experienced uh, group of people in the room. Yeah, um, I can see that. Including Ambassador Milam, who is sitting at the back bench over there. Maybe he can come up to the yeah. table. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to take the, the opportunity of being the moderator to ask a couple of questions while mm -hmm. people get their thoughts together and then we'll begin the conversation with the room mm -hmm. at large. Okay. So, uh, would you like some paper? I'd like, like to have a pen. Yeah. Ah, I'll Let me see whether I have one. Here, I'll give you one. Yeah, pen is with me. Yes, yeah. ah, okay. Um, first of all, uh, you, you talked about the 57 members of the organization of the Islamic OIC. Conference, mm -hmm. OIC. Uh, are there any countries in there that you would see as a model of a constitution or a political system that you could ideally point to? Are there any members of that 57 group? So that, that's the, the first question. The second question I have is related to your comment about the jamaat e islami that when they're in government, they don't change the system. Mm -hmm. They've never actually been the majority party in mm -hmm. Bangladesh, if, if I yeah. remember correctly. So is this when they are a member of a coalition? Is, is that yeah. what you're referring to? Yeah, okay, so exactly. Uh, when, uh, from 2001 to 2006, uh, Jamaat Islami had a coalition with BNP, one of the largest political parties in Bangladesh. They had a coalition and they assumed power and they had a couple of ministers in the cabinet. So otherwise, if you look into the electoral support of Jamaat Islami in Bangladesh, it was never been more than 5% as good as in Pakistan. Even in Pakistan, they don't enjoy much electoral support, but some of the political parties, they have soft corners, some organizations. But in Bangladesh, definitely the BNP is leading Right now, they are leading uh, a coalition of 20 political parties. Mostly, these are Islamist political parties. So that's why, you know, Jamaat Islami was so important in Bangladesh. So far as YC is concerned, definitely, I cannot see any role model, but I can mention about one country. I am not, I'm not sure whether you know the name, that is Tataristan. I visited Tataristan. So Tataristan, I consider that is the most uh, secular Muslim majority country I have ever visited. Uh, though where the population, Muslim population is 48% uh, and Christian population is nearly 40%, there are some other faiths as well. But I have seen the amity, amity between two faiths, Muslims and Christians. It is a unique example for all of us to watch the politics and society of Tataristan. So in uh, one very interesting thing that has struck me while watching the social systems, the Tatars, you know, they claim that 33% marriage in Tatarstan is interfaith marriage. There are mosques and there are churches side by side. And the harmony and the amity, friendship between the two faiths, it is really amazing. I have seen that Muslims are raising funds to construct church in the Muslim majority areas, in Muslim majority neighborhood, and as well as Christians are raising funds to construct a mosque in the Christian neighborhood. And I have seen one synagogue, you know, in Kazan, the city, capital city of Tatarstan. The Muslims, they raised funds to set up a synagogue in Kazan because there was no synagogue before that. So that was a unique example, but it's a small country. It, uh, it is not that uh, visible, their activities are not visible. But our constitution, definitely the 1972 constitution of Bangladesh, it could be a role model for other countries, you know. To guarantee secularism, there is no other way you have to prohibit politics in the name of religion. Politics, when you introduce political Islam, 
definitely Islam in itself, it has different exp uh, explanation, different interpretation. There are 73 sects in Islam according to Hadith and Quran. So which one is the correct? Sunnis are claiming that we are the correct, we are the f true followers of Islam. Shias are claiming that we are the true followers of Islam. Ahmadis, Ismailis, and many, many, you know, 73 sects as mentioned. So leave this politics, leave this religion apart from politics and state affairs. So that is done in our 72 constitution. My next question is uh, to gain a little more insight into the education system, you described it very briefly. Mm -hmm. If you could shed a little more light on how the madrasas and then the state-run madrasas mm -hmm. function uh, and, and how the, the regular Bengali uh, vernacular schools mm -hmm. relate mm -hmm. to the English medium schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is very interesting. In 72's constitution, you know, it said that there should be a single education system not a multi-dimensional educational system that we are having for several hundred years back. It is during, Bangladesh was, uh, or the you know, subcontinent India was part of the British colony. And when British ruled India, and they introduced this madrasa education system, it is nearly 150 years back. But in the, during the colonial period, madrasa education was quite liberal. It was, uh, at that time, this Wahhabism was not that strong. Wahhabism was there, but it was all just uh, 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 conceived by few elites, not by the common people. So madrasa education during British period, even to some extent during the Pakistan period, from 47 to uh, 71, we have seen that it was not that radical. But after 71, when money started coming from Middle Eastern countries, particularly from Saudi Arabia and these, uh, what is this called, Rabat al-Islam and other Islamic NGOs, there are 10 uh, donor organizations I have mentioned in my film as well. They are uh, giving money to not only to Bangladesh, when there are different Muslim majority countries to set up madrasas. So they are responsible for radicalizing madrasa curriculum. So we have madrasa education system Though the, the, there are public madrasas are called Aliyah madrasas, they are more in number. But uh, unfortunately, as I said, that most of the time it was uh, Islamist, uh, they ruled Bangladesh, and they never tried to, you know, m improvise or modernize the madrasa education system. And as well as we have general education system, Bengali education system, it is quite secular, curriculums is quite secular. And uh, English medium, though it is number, the rich people and the you know affluent people, they can afford it. That is the British or American schools and colleges, universities are there. Very expensive. Only the elite people can is, afford it. But the general education in Bangladesh, it is quite liberal. But the problem is that recently you have seen in Gulshan attack, we had one incident in Gulshan in last first July. And you have seen, it is not the madrasa student. These students are coming from English medium schools and universities. Uh, where the PC school in Bangladesh, we have Hopi school, we have uh, kindergarten school, scholastic and others. It is, these schools are also, you know, uh, established by Jamaat Islami. Jamaat Islami is not establishing only the madrasas. They are setting up kindergarten schools, English medium schools, English medium universities. So North-South is one of the universities. If you look into the founding members of North-South University, it is mostly the Jamaat Islamis are there. And the children of those Jamaati leaders like Ghulam Azam and Nizami, they are the teacher of North-South. And their curriculum is also quite radicalized. And, but at the same time, the, uh, this uh, Hijbut Tahrir, the organization I mentioned, they are basically you know, focusing on the English medium schools, not only in Bangladesh, in, across the world. That is, Hijbut Tahrir is now considered as one of the largest Islamist, extreme Islamist organization. Earlier they had their headquarter in London. Still, they have their network in London. But recently, you know, three years back, British government has banned Hijbut Tahrir. But they have their activities. Bangladesh, though Bangladesh banned Hijbut Tahrir, but they are quite active among the English medium schools and universities. So even the English medium schools and universities are not out of the reach of this Islamist. So that is quite alarming. 
I noticed that some of the statistics coming out of recruitment of uh, foreigners by IS, mm -hmm. um, the Islamic State, Daesh, uh, includes the largest number are Bangladeshis in Britain. Mm -hmm. So that must be the Hizbut Tahrir followers. Yeah, that's true. Yes. But interestingly, you know, from Bangladesh, they have recruited less number in compared with other European countries. You know, last March I was addressing an international conference in Stockholm. So I was just taking an account that how many people from Sweden went to fight jihad in Syria. So the foreign ministry, they said, and it is more than 300. And from France, it is more than 1,000. And from UK, it is more than 1,500. But from Bangladesh, so far as record has said, it is nearly 200 youth have joined jihad in Syria. But that is number is not very important. It is the radicalization of the society, Muslim diaspora in the Western countries, as well as in Bangladesh, you, Pakistan, or other Muslim societies. That is very important. Society is getting radicalized. That is quite alarming. Thank you. I'm going to open it up now. So uh, as I recognize you, uh, please uh, Identify yourself and then ask your question or, or give a brief comment so we can get more. So I've got Jay first and then Ambassador Milam. Hello, uh, Jay Kansar. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Hindu American Foundation. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we've been working on the issue of Bangladesh, particularly the issue of, of secular, or of, of um, the lack of secularism in the public square in Bangladesh. So I appreciate the, the points you've made. My question is more for, for Mr. Nawaz um, from the perspective of the Atlantic Council and broader American foreign policy is that why has, why has this conversation of ensuring that constitutions of various countries um, enshrine secularism been a stronger part of American foreign policy, particularly in in South Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, as well as the Middle East with the rise of the Arab Spring to subvert these problems because it, it seems like that this is a trajectory, even if the constitution is secular, if it becomes Islamized, then radicalism just uh, sets into the society. So why is this not a stronger part of our foreign policy dialogue? Is this addressed to me? Yes, yes, yes. As someone who okay. represents a US think tank, I, I'm curious to know why. <laughs> well, it is well, for Mr. Shujana, oh. definitely. <laughs> um, I'm happy to try and answer your question. First of all, uh, representing a U.S. think tank is very different from representing the U.S. government. You know, we have much less leverage with foreign countries, uh, let alone with our own government in, in Washington. So um, I don't think it is, it is for us to be in that position. Of course, what the Atlantic Council has done, and the South Asia Center in particular, you just have to go back and look at all our programs. And I think you've attended almost all the sessions where we've dealt with minority issues and re reports uh, on, on how minorities are treated in South Asia. Um, we can provide a forum, uh, as we have today, so that there is an open discussion uh, there's a little more sharing of information and knowledge, and then that feeds back into the system in Washington as well as overseas. Uh, so that is really our role. Uh, we, we don't have a partisan position on it uh, one way or the other. Yes, of course. It becomes part and parcel of our analyses of the bilateral relationships between countries and even relationships between the U.S. and groups of countries. And of course, uh, it does feed into that, and it will continue to feed into that, which is why, as I said at the beginning of today's session, when I heard Mr. Kabir was coming back to Washington, that I wanted him to talk about the region, so that uh, there are people in this room who will go back and, and report to their principles, uh, whether in the UK government or in the US government or in other agencies of the government, uh, so that they're aware of what can be done. So our whole aim is to, to come up with practicable policy solutions. Uh, next question was from Ambassador Bill Milam. Oh, 
I'm glad you answered that question and not me. The one over here. Uh, I have actually a comment and several questions, but I'll lead with one of the questions which has, which has to do with my defective hearing. What country was it that you were extolling as a model? Tataristan. The Tatars. T A T A R. T A R S T A. If I'm not wrong, this is where Imam is Shamil came from? No, 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 no. no, no. no. Okay. They have this Jadidism concept of Jadidism. Yes. That is progressive. It, it's it's in the Caucasus. Again? It's in the Caucasus. Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay. In the Asia Minor. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you were. I thought you might have been talking about Turkmenistan. Which no, no, would not Turkmenistan. Been. It is in the border of I Europe and Asia. I couldn't figure out why you were saying what you were saying. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, we'll we'll drop this there either. because I wasn't. I was in the wrong part of the world, where I've been for a long time, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I, Mr. Kabir, you uh, have spent a lot of time on the Jamati Islami. Yes. Um, and I know some of the Jamaati Islami leaders, none, thank God, that have been uh, rushed, to their, rushed to their death by hanging uh, recently, uh, but some of the younger ones. And I remember, although I wasn't there, when the Jamaati uh, Islami ministers were part of the BNP government, that was an ill-fated government anyway. But my recollection is that the only two ministers in the whole government who never got accused of, of corruption of any kind were the two Jamatis. Yeah. My conclusion from that very small sample is that at least part of the Jamat uh, program, strategy if you will, is not to take uh, a, the government by force or by force of intel, but by a, example. And I think the ones that I have uh, know, uh, including some who are now in uh, exile because uh, the government is out to get them, um, would be of that, of that mind. They, they are uh, what they are. I certainly don't agree with their religious views. But they are, in my mind, a, a, a group that is out to convince the rest of Bangladesh and the rest of the Islamic world, that their model of Islam is the best. Now that's uh, exclusionary, but I don't think that you can claim that they're radicals. They certainly have not, the ones I know, have never uh, resorted to extremism. These that were tried in the last few years and hung without any semblance of due process, may have resorted to violence. Uh, the, the record's unclear on that. I noticed, by the way, that you didn't say anything about those trials to which all hu other human, human rights activists I know are, uh, are address a really critical statement. So I'd like to hear your views on that. But the, the third thing is, the question, and this is really a question even though it won't sound like one to begin with. Um, there's a r new book out by Ali Riaz. I think you probably know who Ali Riaz I is. Uh, there's a brilliant chapter in it about identity. And in it, <coughs> in this chapter, he makes a long historical analysis and concludes that most Bengalis really have two identities, and they are, you know, mixed and matched in different ways. But one of them is uh, ethnic, they have Bengali, and the other is religious, they're Islam, they're uh, Muslims. And these live together within uh, most Bangladeshis, and in fact create some contradictions in some, quite, quite clear, clearly. But don't you think it's possible for a, uh, a Bangladeshi to be both a Muslim and a Bengali and, and be a secularist too? Yeah, sure. Could I just add uh, uh, just a comment to mm -hmm. tail mm -hmm. to, to uh, Bill's first comment slash question that uh, I've also observed in Pakistan mm -hmm where most of the major political parties are dynastic parties, they're family businesses. That, in fact, the only party that actually 
is democratic with a small d, uh, which has elections regularly from the council uh, neighborhood level up to the top and regularly turfs out their leadership when they are not up to snuff, is the jamaat e islami This is not an endorsement of the jamaat e islami as my party of choice, but in, in terms of democratic principles and elections, uh, the same. And I also recall, and you might want to, to look at your own experience, Marina Ottaway did a study of political parties in the Muslim world, and one of the things she said, for, this is for a Carnegie study, was that in Egypt, whenever they ran workshops on how to take advantage of party organizations and so on, none of the so-called secular parties and the mainstream parties would show up, but uh, all the Muslim Brotherhood people would show up. So they were much better at learning how to organize politically. So you mm -hmm. may want to address for some sure, of those sure, issues sure. also. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ambassador Mailam, for your valuable comments. That, uh, what you said, I'm totally you agree with you that when jamaat e islami ministers uh, were there, two ministers in Khaled Azia's government, there is no charge of a specific corruption. But later, some corruption charges were filed when Kiyataka government was in power from 2007 to 2008. But uh, it, interestingly, I do also agree that jamaat e islami doesn't need to go for financial corruption as they are very, very rich political party. If you compare all the political parties in South Asia, starting from Congress or BJP or Muslim League, PPP or Awami League, BNP in Bangladesh, if you combine all of their budget, it is much more lesser than Jamaat Islami's budget. In my film, you know, The Ultimate Jihad, one Saudi scholar, Dr. Irfan Alavi, I quoted him on camera, he said, that in 2008, Saudi Arabia and other Muslim-majority countries and Middle Eastern countries, they allocated 50 billion pounds for Jamaat Islami and Muslim Brotherhood, focusing on South Asia. So they are receiving enormous amount of funds from Middle Eastern countries. As I mentioned about Rabat al-Islam, Rabat al-Islam is the largest Islamic NGO in the world. So, and in Bangladesh as well, when Professor Abul Barkar uh, started into their economic network, the economic empire Jamaat Islami has built in Bangladesh, banking and other business industries, transports and you know, real estate business, they are also accumulating huge amount of money from the business. So that's why they don't need to make money being a minister and other. But what Jamaat did, they have recruited their cadres infiltrated their cadres in every layer of the administration. And when his army was, uh, you know, first he was an uh, agriculture minister and later he became the industry minister, in a forum of Jamaat Islami, in the conference of Jamaat Islami, he said that when I was agriculture minister, I have recruited 23,000 Jamaat Islami activists, workers in the government, different government services. So that is what very important. Jamaat Islami didn't was not involved making money while they were in power, but they radicalized the administration. They infiltrated their cadres in the administration. That is a very important thing. You said about Jamaat Islami's radical views that now they believe in democracy and other things. Well, I would like to request you to understand, if you want to understand Jamaat Islami, you have to read the writings of Maulana Abul Allah Maududi the philosophy of Jamaat Islami, what it says. It is clearly anti-democratic, it is clearly fascist and uh, fascist idea, and Maududi himself promoted and encouraged fascism during the Second World War. He said in his writing, you know, Tarjumanul Quran, he said that, well, I do not believe in democracy. Democracy is an infidel Western idea. On the contrary, I appreciate fascism and Nazism pr promoted by Mussolini and Hitler in Europe. You have to follow that. A small number of educated people will rule the ignorant masses. So that is the basic philosophy of you know, fascism. So in, in many writings of Abu Lala Maududi, you will find that he is promoting fascism, not democracy. And he considers democracy as an infidel idea. So what Jamaat Islami is trying to do since 1957, before 1957, Mr. Shijan Nawaz will be knowing better than me, in Pakistan, they never contested in election. Only in 1957, 
they adopted a resolution that henceforth they are going to contest in the election. And before that, Maududi said, contested election is an infidel idea. They don't believe in election. So if you want to understand Jamaat Islamist philosophy, definitely you have to study Maududi's writing. You have to study writings of Hassan al-Banna and Said Qutub. Then you will understand what kind of radicalism Jamaat Islam is promoting. And how do you explain that, how they legitimize the genocide of 1971. They are responsible for killing three million Bengalis in Bangladesh. And again, it is in the name of Islam. What Ghulam Azam said at that time, it is very much written. It is recorded in the publication. If there is no Pakistan, there will be no Islam. And that's why to protect Pakistan and to protect Islam, they randomly killed three million people and uh, they raped 200,000 women and they justified it in the name of Islam. So that is Jamaat Islamist politics. Until now, what is going on in Bangladesh and other in Pakistan and other part of the world, they are trying to justify it in the name of Islam. So when we say that Islam is a religion of peace and submission, so it is Sufi Islam, it is not the Wahhabi Islam. It is the Sufis who preached Islam in South Asian countries or other part of the world. When Islam tried to preach by the you know, warriors like Jamaat Islami, well, they did a mess. You remember the case of Pakistan. When Bin Qasim tried to, he conquered Sindh and tried to introduce Islam by force, he failed. But when Sufis came from the Middle Eastern, in the Central Asian countries, from the West Middle Eastern countries, and they succeeded because the Sufis, they had a genuine respect for the local faith, local tradition. They have absorbed, acc accumulated the uh, local you know, tradition, and that's why you know uh, they talked about amity and friendship, and that's why the Islam was spread in the South Asian countries. Mm -hmm. So, but Jamaat Islami, as we have seen, the when the rise of Islamic militancy, the Sufi Islam has become also one of the major target of Jamaat Islami. I have seen in Pakistan many many Sufi shrines that have been destroyed by these you know Wahhabists in Bangladesh as well. They have attacked Shah Jalal's shrine, and there they have tried to kill the British High Commissioner at that time while he was visiting Shah Jalal's, one of the Sufi shrine in Bangladesh. So they are anti-Sufi. They are against liberal interpretation of Islam. They are in favor of introducing blasphemy law. And uh, in Pakistan, they did. And Bangladesh, they have submitted the bill. It is The bill was submitted by Mati Rahman Nizami. So if you want to say that blasphemy, concept of blasphemy and concept of declaring Ahmadis and non-Muslims are persecuting the minorities in the name of Islam is justified and it is moderate and liberalism. Sorry, I beg to differ. But, well, interesting point you have read, Mr. Mailam, about the trial of the war criminal. You said that we are trying Jamaat Islami. No, sorry, we are not trying the Jamaat Islami as a party, but we are demanding our government put in a pressure to try Jamaat Islami as a party. But till now, Government is trying, the tribunal is trying, only the individuals. Well, some of them, most of them, they belong to Jamaat Islami, but there are two individuals from BNP, there are two individuals from Awami League, the ruling party, and other you know, partner of Awami League, the Jatiya party. So it is not the party who have been tried, it is the crimes of 1971, what they committed, the individuals, how they committed genocide and crimes against humanity, that is, that's why these people are on the dock. And whatever the criticisms are, they, my, in my recent film, I have answered them all, you know. The human rights organizations are raising questions about the standard of the trial and the transparency of the trial. Sorry, we said that, well, it's a domestic tribunal. We are trying these criminals under domestic law. It is not an international tribunal, though the crimes are international. But in every, each and every country, the judiciary is sovereign and independent. In Saudi Arabia, they have own system of judiciary. In USA, you have your own system of judiciary. The way you are trying the prisoners of Guantanamo, well, as an individual, I can say that it is not to the, up to the standard because these people, they don't have right to defend themselves. But in Bangladesh, we have given all the opportunities to the defense. They can appoint their own lawyers, they can have enough time, they can examine any papers, whatever the, presented by the government or the, by prosecution, and they have given right to appeal, they have given right to review, review the judgment of the appeal, even they have the right to uh, uh, beg for uh, President Social Mercy. So all these standards, which are not visible in any other tribunal, starting from Nuremberg to Cambodia, 
If you look into the uh, war crimes trial, that is a unique model, you know. We are following the basic principles of the Nuremberg trial set up by America, Russia, France, and Britain. So uh, we have adopted these uh, you know, basic principles, but we have improved a lot because in Nure from Nuremberg to Cambodia, in all these international tribunals, there was no scope for appeal and review for the defense. But we have included that in our you know, case. So we are giving all the facilities to the defense. But unfortunately, the, some of the you know, human rights organization, mostly they are influenced by Jamaati propaganda, and they are crying for the human rights of the perpetrators of genocide. They don't have to say they are not concerned about the uh, victims of genocide. They are not concerned about the victims of genocide. I talked to Brad Adams of Human Rights you know, Watch and uh, Amnesty International. I have a very good relation with Amnesty International because when I was in jail in 90, 2001, Amnesty International declared me prisoner of conscience. I have a very good relation with them. And when they protested and challenged the tribunal, I said that, well, what was your position in 1971 when there was a genocide? Have you ever condemned it? So have you ever looked into this tribunal from the perspective of the victims of the genocide? You are considering this tribunal that they are making injustice to the defense, that is, who are the perpetrators of genocide. But what about your position about the victims of genocide? Three million people have been killed, and these families, they were crying for justice for more than four decades. After four decades and after pretty long 40 years, the tribunal has been formed. And that's why, you know, uh, now we are trying in our own way with the limited resources, because you know that in other countries, in, even in Cambodia, trial of the war criminals, it is very, very expensive thing. You need, you know, many, many things from, uh, we have to import from other countries. But in Bangladesh, with limited resources, with our experience, judicial capacity, and with their long tradition of judiciary, we are trying them, and other countries, you know, I can tell you that many, many countries, those who couldn't try the perpetrators of genocide in their countries, like many, many countries are there. You know, in 19th century, many genocides have been taken, but very few perpetrators of genocide brought to book. But now those countries are looking at Bangladesh, that if Bangladesh is succeeded to try the uh, perpetrators of genocide, and therefore they will follow the example of Bangladesh. That's why this trial is so important, and yesterday I have explained in my film as well. You mentioned about Aliria's book, that there are two strong identities. Well, I read his book. I know his views very well. When the Muslim identities were introduced in Bengal, just tell me one thing. The Muslim identity, it became important just uh, during the Pakistan movement. It is very, very new in Bengal, you know, from Pakistan movement, this Muslim identity, that is the political Islam and Muslim League, and we had, you know, Muslim League in power during the power, you know that, during the partition, Mr. Shuja Nawaz knows it very well. Well, it's a very recent phenomenon. Even the Wahhabis, when they came to introduce their Wahhabism in Bengal, the mass people, the people in the rural areas, they rejected Wahhabism. Only the elite of Bengal, they welcomed Wahhabism. Bang Bengali, Bengali identity, the ethnic identity is much more stronger than the religious or the ethnic identity, ethnic by faith identity, that is Islam. Well, before Islam was introduced, we had Buddhist, we have Hindus, and before Hinduism was introduced in Bengal, we were enemies, we are pagans. You know, our history is more than 5,000 years old. So when Hinduism was introduced, only 3,000 years back Hinduism was introduced, and 2,000 years back Buddhism was introduced, and Islam was introduced only 1,000 years back, and Christianity introduced only 500 years, but Bengali, as an ethnic identity, they are enjoying a secular way of life since the dawn of the history. That is the you know, uniqueness of Bengali culture. I have written articles, I have books you know, about the secular history of Bengal. So that will not you know, support that the Bengali Muslim identity is so very strong like the ethnic identity. This Muslim identity became strong during the Pakistan movement. And 
during the Pakistani rule, that Muslim identity was challenged as Pakistani ruler tried to suppress all the movement in Bengal in the name of Islam. So they saw that, that Islamic identity, the Bengali Islamic identity, it is meaningless, you know, the way Pakistan was created, the way East Pakistan became Bengal part of, became Bengal part of the Pakistan. So it, the view was rejected. So now the constitution we adopted in 1972 with the sacrifice of three million people, we should, we are, we're trying to stand on that constitution. We are trying to re reintroduce the values and the spirit of the constitution. And that is the spirit of thousand years history of Bengal. So you have said the dynastic party, uh, dynastic rule of the political parties. Well, unfortunately, Mr. Shujanavas, it is not only Bangladesh or South, Pakistan or South Asia. It is a culture of tradition of Asian. It is Asian culture, but well, for more important thing is rather the dynastic rule, it is that whether they are capable to rule the country. It is not important that just because Benazir was daughter of uh, you know, Zulfikar Ali, that's why she will not be eligible to rule the country. It is not that. If she is you know, capable to run the country, definitely she should be elected. If she's been elected, definitely she should be given chance. It is not the question that we have to consider her as the daughter of Benazir, or you have to consider her Sheikh Hasina as daughter of Sheikh Mujib, or Khaled as a wife of Zia Raman. It is not the question of dynasty. It's a question of the capability, capacity. So Jamaat Islami definitely, though they, not, they do not believe in democracy as a philosophy, they do practice democracy in the party organ. Mm -hmm. They have elections that every you know three or four years, and they follow that principles in the constitution. But again, recently you know two years back, our high court banned Jamaat Islami to contest in the election. Why? The reason is that Jamaat Islami's constitution is quite contradictory to Bangladesh constitution, because in Bangladesh constitution, in Article Seven B, it said that people of the supreme sovereign power of the country for the democracy. And the representative of the people will frame the you know, laws in the sitting in the parliament. But Jamaat Islami do not believe in the sovereignty of the people, they believe in the sovereignty of Allah. And that's why, and they do not believe in the equality of the people. Though no, Muslim, no non Muslims are allowed to join Jamaat Islami, and no uh, women are allowed to be in the Majlisha Shura, that is the Central Committee. So they are discriminating men and women, they are discriminating people on the basis of sex, on the basis of religion. That's why our High Court disqualified Jamaat Islami to contest in the election. So, with this, you know, views, I think that uh, well, how democratic they are in their organizational matter, but in practice. It's a totally fascist party. We have a question here, and then there, and then here, yeah, and then finally Mark. Hi. Um, I'll try to keep my question short, because there yes. are quite a few. Um, I'm Mike Gerning. I used to run counter extremism programs in Pakistan, so I enjoyed um, listening to, these, uh, to your talk about the historical trends of p political Islam in Bangladesh and drawing comparisons. I wondered if you could comment on recent trends in the radicalization in Bangladesh. You mentioned the attack in the cafe. If Jamati Islami has been a kind of a vehicle for kind of radical Islamist kind of thought and movements before, uh, does ISIS and other groups represent uh, a new threat that we should be aware of? Is, is, is it t t t different in kind? Yeah, thank you. suggest this, if I can get one other question from this side, um, then you can answer two at a time. Uh, and we'll um, speed it up because we're going to run out of time. Yeah, and mine's sort of related to the previous question. Um, I'm Jenny Anderson. I'm with the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, I mean, there's, um, from a democracy perspective, there's increasing concern that the democratic space in Bangladesh is shrinking and that it's slowly becoming a one-party system. Um, and, on, and that Awami League is using, or not using, but addressing, because of the threat of terrorism, the space is shutting more quickly and alternative voices aren't able to be heard. Um, and the second part of my question, sorry, it's long. Um, also that um, addressing that the terrorism threat by Awami League is looked at by, is something generated by Jamaat Islami or even the opposition BNP and perhaps not looking at the growing presence of Islamic State, 
or AQIS or even um, JMB's um, presence in the country. And so. Can I add Huji to that also? Of course. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have two questions or two okay. sets of questions. Uh, but yeah, quite similar, you know, uh, about the recent, you know, rise of Islamic militancy or the act of terrorism in Bangladesh. Definitely uh, these people, as we said that uh, earlier, it was a madrasa students and now it is done committed by the young, you know, uh, English medium, uh, students from English medium school and universities. But that is not very important. Important thing is the philosophy. What kind of philosophy radicalized them? They are getting radicalized by, you know, uh, ideas of Al-Qaeda, IS, or Muslim Brotherhood, or Abu Lala Mahdudi, Jamaat Islami. So it is, a, 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 you know, uh, important that what prompt them to commit such act in the name of Islam. You have seen, you know, the incident, what happened in Gulshan in a restaurant. There were, you know, foreign nationals, there are non-Muslims, and they entered with gun, the five or six boys, you know, they said first they discriminated all the foreigners and they discriminated, uh, separated all the foreigners and they said that who are the Muslims and non-Muslims, so they separated them on the basis of that. And that, and then it started killing them. So this is very much, you know, idea of Abu Lala Maududi. This is the idea of Said Qutub. This is the idea of Hassan al-Banna. It, it, it doesn't matter whether it is carried by, you know, uh, Harkatul Jihad or JMB or ISIS and Al-Qaeda. That is, name is not very important. Idea is very important. We are concerned, I am concerned about the ideas, about the philosophy that is, changing the mindset of the youth that if anybody says anything against this kind of idea, he's eligible to be killed. Well, even in Pakistan period, I can tell you that they are, as they are killing these uh, free thinkers, branding them atheists, even in Pakistan period, Shujabai, you will be surprised to know, in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, there is an organization, organization of the atheist. And they had open office in Dhaka, and they used to publish their organ. And atheism was a, allowed to preach, and nobody, you know, killed them. The other groups, they wrote against it. Well, Ahmed Sharif, my teacher, Ahmed Sharif, is one of the founder of that atheist organization. So other people, they criticized him. Oh, well, it is, he is anti-Islam, and he will go to hell, and other things, they cursed them. They never tried to kill them. So. What makes them atheists to be eligible to be killed? Again, you have to go to the you know, ideas of Madhudis and uh, Hassan al-Banna and Said Qutub. So that is the question of radicalizing there. You know. The question of democracy, you said that democracy, you know, it is the ground of democracy shrinking, and uh, even Ali Riaz also argued in his book uh, that, well, it is one of the main reasons, since there is no democracy, that's why terrorism is rising in Bangladesh. Well, my view is quite different. I can say that, what about America? Don't you see that America has less democracy compared to other countries? What about France or Britain? There are, these terrorist activities are taking place. And there are homegrown you know, terrorists, in, even in France, even in the US, even in the UK. So it is not the question of democracy. Again, I say that, I repeat, I'm repeating again. It is the philosophy. Earlier, you know what happened before this social networking, Jamaat Islami or Muslim Brotherhood leaders, very often they used to visit these countries. I can name the, one of the top Jamaati leaders, he is now in the dock, well, in the prison. Uh, uh, it is Saidi, Delwaro Saidi. Very often he used to visit USA and he used to address the Bengali Muslim diaspora and uh, he used to preach his ideas and collect money and promote jihadism promote hate against West. And you see, their network is quite as strong in the USA. You have this ICNA, you know, Islamic Center for North America. One of the Jamaati leader, you know, Ashrafu Zaman Khan, who was sentenced to death by our tribunal for committing genocide in uh, 1971. He is one of the leader of ICNA in USA, and he is promoting jihad and taking advantage of American democracy, freedom of expression, freedom of you know of organization, and moving everywhere. But these people, as I said, that these people are responsible for radicalizing Muslim diaspora in your country. If you do not, you know, challenge them. If you do not 
Well, we are asking U.S. government to hand over him to Bangladesh for, to, uh, uh, you know, for uh, whatever the crimes he has committed. But unfortunately, we don't have extraditional treaty with the U.S. Uh, that's why and, uh, he said that, well, if he goes to Bangladesh, Bangladesh government will hang him. So, but you have to get ready for this consequence. As I said, that if you allow to grow Islamic militancy, here in America or in Bangladesh, at the end of the day, there will be a series of 9-11. You have to be prepared for that. So democracy, well, democracy definitely, we have uh, uh, some debate and uh, crisis of democracy. Democratic culture is very important. Well, most of the time, as I said, that since the inception of Bangladesh, most of the time it is ruled by the Islamists or the, by the military. We couldn't develop a kind of democratic culture, what you are you know, enjoying in USA or in European countries. For several hundred years, you have developed those democratic values, democratic institutions here in the West. But think about Bangladesh or in Pakistan. Most of the time, since the inception of uh, you know, Pakistan and Bangladesh, most of the time we were ruled by the Islamists or the military. Very short time we had time to develop those democratic institutions and education is very, very important. Culture, democratic culture is very, very important. That is, that there is a need to grow, you know, values, democratic values. But definitely I will say that it is the rise of Islamic militancy, what we are watching in Bangladesh, it has nothing to do with whether we have a democracy or we have a military government. It is not that. Shamila, we have two questions here. First, the gentleman, wait for the microphone, please. And then here, and then the last two will be on opposite sides of the room. Thank you. Uh, I'm Andrew Flo, and I'm with the Center for uh, Religion and Diplomacy. I wanted to ask how actors in civil society can work to combat violent extremism, especially when the local government is not necessarily helpful. Um, looking at examples of the prime minister making comments that uh, people who insult religion might be at part and fault for violent extremism against them, and examples where bloggers uh, went to police for protection and uh, were purportedly ignored. Well, Bangladesh, we have... Just one more question. Okay. Go ahead. You want the mic? No, you're. Oh. Okay. Well, I, I, Jenny, pretty much asked my question. I just want to ask you very directly. The last you have to identify I'm yourself. sorry. My name is Mark Goff. I'm a business consultant here in Washington D.C. But I've done quite a bit of work in Bangladesh and been there quite a few times. The last two elections, by all, obs all obs uh, outside observers, including Human Rights Watch, Democracy International, and even independent people from the State Department, have been uh, have been decimated. Uh, people have been turned away at the polls. Democracy is diminished almost to nothing um, by the current regime. And and you believe that the disempowerment of people at the polls does not feed into Isla Islamism? Is is that correct? Well, first of all, uh, let me answer to the civil society you know, movement. Definitely in Bangladesh, we have a very vibrant civil society movement. And uh, it is not uh, recently, you know, since the inception of Pakistan in 1948, the civil society is quite active to promote, you know, secular democratic values. Still, we are on the street, and uh, definitely what Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina said about the killing of the bloggers, well, we didn't expect that comment from her because when the first uh, killing uh, took place on 13th, uh, in uh, February 2013, she visited the victims, you know, house, and she, cons he, she consoled their parents, and she said that it is we are not going to spare Jamaat Islami. It is Jamaat Islami is a terrorist organization, and we are going to take action against Jamaat Islami. Again, as I said, that Jamaat Islami had an alliance with BNP, one of the largest political party in Bangladesh. They have a strong relation with YC and uh, US and uh, other Western countries. So it is not easy to try Jamaat Islami if she thinks. That's why we are trying to create a kind of public awareness about Jamaat Islami, how they are involved with terrorism, why there is a need to try Jamaat Islami as a terrorist organization, and why there is a need to ban Jamaat Islami. So we are trying, you know, for the last 24 years, we are, the civil society is continuing their movement 
for banning Jamaat-e Islami as it was banned in 1972 Scan institution. But still, as I said, that now, you know, we can see that some of the Jamaat-e Islamis, they are joining Aumi League, you know. So that is also a kind of, you know, radicalization we are watching in the ruling party as well. So that is the tactics of Jamaat-e Islami. When BNP was in power or BNP was strong, they infiltrated in BNP. Now the Awami League is in power, so they are trying to infiltrate in Awami League, and they are trying to radicalize Awami League. So that is very, very unfortunate. But so far, democracy definitely in 2014, we expected that BNP should join the election, and we also anticipated at that time, many of the political observers wrote, including me, that if BNP joined the election, there was a fair chance to win for their victory. But the problem with, with, with Jamaat Islami, as before the elections, so High Court has prohibited Jamaat Islami in contesting the election. So Jamaat Islami didn't allow BNP to contest the election. And so rest is a history. You know, you can see that without the BNP and Jamaat election took place, other political parties they participated, and later BNP rejected the election result. But what they did. They created violence on the street, and uh, they burned, you know, public properties, people life, and you know everything. And for 90 days, you know, they continued the violence in the name of, for for restoration of democracy. But that is not the way. People didn't support that kind of violence for restoration of democracy. As I said, that democracy is very much needed, but it is a long drawn process. You know, we have to develop democratic institutions, culture, education practices from home to outside in the society. So it should be practiced everywhere. So that is the problem with Bangladesh, and that is what we are also trying in our own limited capacity to promote secular democracy and to create awareness among the people in favor of secular democracy. Please. Another question here. Yeah. Have I responded to your question? I, I already asked my question. Oh, okay. Unless you know where Mr. Korsan and Mr. Jahodri are, along with the other thousands of people that have been dragged off the streets of Dhaka, but that's probably for another Okay, discussion. let's proceed. Okay. Uh, final two questions on either side of the room. Hello, thank you for a wonderful presentation. My name is Utsav, and I'm with the World Hindu Council. Um, the question that I have is that your presentation covers a lot about jamaat e islamis activities and the radicalization that it brings to the Bangladeshi society. What is your opinion about the tabligs? Because in countries like Maldives, the tabligi jamaat has been responsible for direct recruitment to ISIS, mm -hmm. and it has one of the highest percentage of contributors towards mm -hmm. Islamic State recruitment. So tabligs are very powerful in Bangladesh too. So mm -hmm. to me, it looks like the tabligh and the Jamaat Islami have a Coke Pepsi model of radicalization where each tries to beat the other in trying to radicalize people. So what is your thought on that? Well, it is very interesting in case sorry, of Bangladesh. Can, can I get the second question and then you can wrap okay. up? Thanks, sorry to interrupt okay. you. Gives you a little time to. Sorry, first of all, I was a wee bit late, so I apologize about that. My name is Jawad Qureshi. I'm with the Government of Canada, the Privy Council Office. My question is actually quickly two-part. One, I'm sorry you missed your presentation, so you may very well have addressed this, but what is the role of political Islam that you see in Bangladesh with, people have mentioned it, a very vibrant identity, both Bengali but also Islamic. Is there a role for political Islam in terms of the politics of the country? My, the second part to my question is, um, I, as much as we may have talked about ISIL or the new JMB and educated, westernized youth being part of it, the impression I have of AQIS is it has a heavy recruitment from the Bangladeshi military, maybe serving in former officers. Can you say anything about the Islamization of the Bangladeshi military? Thank you so much. So the first one is about Tablik Jamaat. It is very interesting about the Tablik Jamaat of Bangladeshi and Tablik Jamaat of Pakistan or you know Maldives. When I visited Pakistan a uh, few years back, and the same you know issues were raised by our friends in Pakistan. They said that what you are, how you are addressing Tablik Jamaat in Bangladesh. But it is very interesting in Bangladesh, Tablik Jamaat is ma maintaining a distant relation from Jamaat Islami and other political Islamic political parties. They are only engaged in uh, arranging one, you know, uh, tablig, uh, you know, jalsa in every year. Only they are confined uh, to this jalsa. In every January, they have this gathering, religious gathering, and uh, 
few, you know, million people participate there. And as the, at the same time, they are preaching Islam, you know, that is that the Dawah program, the invitation program, which is not necessarily violent. They are preaching in a very peaceful manner. The big Jamaat in Pakistan and Maldives are quite different. In, Bangla in Pakistan, I have seen Tablik Jamaats are quite directly linked to these Islamists and Tablik, the, you know, Talibans and al Qaeda's, but as well as in Maldives. But Bangladesh, it is not the case. So far as Islamization of the military in Bangladesh, well, I can tell you that, as I said, that most of the time, Bangladesh was ruled by these Islamists, and they, when they were in power, they tried to Islamize the military as well. And even in during Pakistan period, that we have seen a kind of Islamization in the military. It was, uh, we call it a, a Kakul syndrome. But uh, now we have found only two person, you know, from military who have joined Jihad. And there are a few more. But uh, since this government assumed power, the present government, Sheikh Hasina, is trying to de-radicalize our military and uh, they have already removed some of the senior officials, a strong supporter or members of Jamaat Islami uh, from uh, the army. So that is, government is trying to de-radicalize the administration, both civil and military, but it will take a lot of time. But these people, as I, I can say, that they are much more stronger in the civil s s services rather than the military service, the radical Jamaat Islami. Earlier they were, there was a significant presence of Jamaat Islami, including uh, Ghulam Azam's son. You know, Ghulam Azam was, uh, you know, chief of Jamaat Islami. His son was one of the senior uh, army officials, but he was removed uh, when Sheikh Hasina assumed power. So government is trying to de-radicalize the administration and particularly the military. And now, because another aspect of Bangladesh military is that Bangladesh is the largest supplier of the Peace Corps mission in the United Nations. So definitely, if the military is very much Islamized, uh, the United Nations won't be interested to recruit them from Bangladesh. And that's why Bangladesh is also trying hard to de-radicalize the army so that they can serve much for the peacekeeping missions in the United Nations. Thank you so, very much. Thank uh, you very much. As promised, uh, this was going to be a, an interesting give and take, and we saw that. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it, some issues that we at the Atlantic Council have been engaged with for some time. For many years, we have talked about the danger uh, faced by South Asia once mm -hmm. the migrant workers begin coming back from the Middle East. As those economies tighten up, uh, you won't just have the economic ill effects, but you will also have migration of thought, because mm -hmm. they will come back and they will tell their local counterparts that you are not practicing the right kind of Islam. So I think this is uh, something that we will remain sure, engaged sure, with. Sure, so sure. we hope you will come back uh, in, in another year or two, uh, share with us further sure. your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, in the meantime, I, on behalf of uh, Bharat Gopala Swami and, and his team at the South Asia Center. Um, and on behalf of the leadership of the Atlantic Council, I want to thank all of you for making this a really interesting session. Thank you. Thank you very much.